I just want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak today at such a fantastic celebration, um, celebrating 50 years of the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center and thinking about the next 50 years. So to start, I want to just take a look at a few headlines that have been in recent media. You've probably seen many of these, if not all of them. And one of the things that they each depict is that racial inequities exist in maternal mortality and in breast cancer. And these have been the topic of discussion for many, for many years. These headlines might suggest that black women or women racialized as black have poorer health outcomes, um, specifically related to maternal outcomes and breast cancer, or maybe that they have poorer health outcomes in general. But is that true? Is race a risk factor for poor health outcomes? The simple answer is no. What each of these reports and the underlying research tell us is that racial inequities exist in such a way that women racialized as black experience poor health outcomes. What these headlines and what these reports cannot tell us is the reasons that these inequities exist. You'll hear me throughout the talk use the term inequity, disparity, and I want to distinguish between the two. So a disparity is a measure of difference between two groups, while an inequity suggests that the difference exists because of some injustice. So it's more actionable. In other words, the only way to correct an inequity is through action. So getting back to the headlines, none of these, suggest, none of these tell us why these disparities or inequities exist um, in the first place. So race as we know it and the way it's most often operationalized in research has no biological basis. There is no, um, it isn't a causal factor for any health outcome. Um, race, race is socially constructed, but it is a surrogate for other social determinants of health, and these social determinants of health are highly predictive of our lived experiences. So we heard in Dr. Baccarelli's talk that where we live, where we work, where we play, where we pray, our zip code is much more predictive of our outcomes. Um, so rather than focusing on the impact of race or the contribution of race in cancer research, we should really be considering the impact of place. For example, how might where we live affect the cells in our bodies? Or how might where we live, how does our zip code affect biomarkers in our blood, in our tissues, in the tumor microenvironment among individuals diagnosed with cancer? These are some of the questions that can be answered. Um, and I would say these are the types of questions that we should be trying to answer. In my research, um, in some of my collaborative research where I collaborate with social and spatial epidemiologists, we have found that certain neighborhood factors significantly correlate with the risk of poor breast cancer outcomes. So I put this image up to give you an example. Um, how would you describe the photo on the left versus the photo on the right? Um, can you imagine what living in a neighborhood like the one on the left might be like or the one on the right? On the left, you can see some of the effects of neighborhood disinvestment. You can see things like graffiti, debris, boarded windows. You see things um, like crumbling sidewalks and, and abandoned buildings. But on the right, you can see that this neighborhood is well kept. There's walkable sidewalks, green space. Other things that you might deduce from this picture is that residents in the neighborhood on the right might have access to grocery stores and walking distance. Or maybe they have access to um, organic foods, more so than neighborhoods more so than residents in um, neighborhoods like the one on the left. Um, so using data from the New Jersey State Cancer Registry, we actually found that increasing 
physical disorder in neighborhoods is actually associated, well actually these are measures of neighborhood disinvestment, but increasing physical disorder is significantly associated with shorter breast cancer survival. Probably not surprising was that our data showed that black and Hispanic women resided in neighborhoods that looked like the one on the left 69% of the time. So these neighborhoods, these zip codes, represent areas that have the highest levels of neighborhood disinvestment. And increasing neighborhood disinvestment is associated with underinsurance, late stage diagnosis of cancer, higher grade tumors, and with triple negative breast cancer risk. So the most aggressive form of breast cancer. Areas with these high levels of observable neighborhood disinvestment are also the communities that have lower socioeconomic composition. They have less primary care physicians per person, greater residential uh, racial segregation, and overall higher population density. So again, thinking about place rather than race is what really will help us predict health outcomes. So we also found that neighborhood redlining is associated with inequities in breast cancer. By redlining, I mean the, the government-sponsored practice of denying individuals access to mortgages based on the location of properties and homes in minority and social, socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods. So in terms of the likelihood of qualifying for a mortgage approval, areas coded as red in this map were considered hazardous or risky um, and those that are in yellow were also risky, but a little less so than the red areas. And the blue and the green areas were the desirable areas for mortgages. Through the system of redlining, black Americans were prevented from purchasing homes in, in areas that were blue or green, and therefore they were relegated to res residing in areas that are red. As I mentioned, those areas are also the areas that looked like the photo that was on the left. The most interesting thing about our findings was that pre so present day redlining, um, residents in an, an area that was historically redlined to you know living there now was associated with, uh, actually I need to, <laughs> Rephrase. So the, 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 found, the study found that present day residents in areas that were not redlined, so these were the blue and the green areas, were actually associated with better breast cancer outcomes. Um, so women that resided in those areas had lower odds of late stage diagnosis, lower odds of high grade tumors, and lower odds of triple negative breast cancer subtype, and they also had lower hazards of breast cancer specific mortality. So thinking about what I just said, so residents in areas that were not redlined were associated with better outcomes, right? The, the, <laughs> the unfortunate thing was that black and Hispanic women who also resided in these not redlined areas did not have those positive um, benefits. So another way to interpret that is that the potential intergenerational impacts of living in a historically redlined area, which and redlining is not legal today, but it still has a potential impact on health um, today. So another point is about the historical and persistent underrepresentation of black and Hispanic individuals and other marginalized groups, rural residents, um, LGBTQ populations, we can think of other vulnerable populations that have also been underrepresented in genomics research and cancer genomics research. Most genomics data have been generated from populations of largely European ancestry. And because of this, we know a lot about the genetic mutations that are linked to cancer in these groups, and we know much less about their impacts among black women with breast cancer, for instance. Um, for example, we heard in Dr. Castrinos' talk about the BRCA1 and 2 genes. Those, the mutations and their relationships with cancer risk 
was really discovered and really um, characterized in the, early, in the early 90s in a population of Ashkenazi Jewish women of European ancestry. Um, it took over 20 years for new data to emerge connecting those same mutations in BRCA1 and 2 with cancer risk in black women. The other thing that we know from emerging data is that black women have a higher prevalence of variants of unknown significance in these well-characterized genes. Something else we know is that breast cancer and cancers in general are not just due to mutations in one gene. So multiple genes and multiple hotspots across the genome have been linked to cancer susceptibility. And through the combination of genetic markers, clinical history, and family history, polygenic risk scores can be used to assess an individual's true cancer risk. But unfortunately, in breast cancer, the assessment of risk using these models and these risk scores do not always do not function the same way for black and Hispanic women. So they're not as accurate and they're not as useful as they are for women of European ancestry. So similar to what Dr. Castrinos mentioned, we really need to make sure that cancer risk models are useful for all populations so that there can be equity in outcomes and also in prevention. So underrepresentation of diverse study participants in clinical trials is also problematic and has been. It's widely documented that breast cancer clinical trials continue to suffer from a lack of representation of the US population and global populations. A recent cancer review or recent review documented that while black individuals accounted for 12% of all breast cancer cases in 2020, they accounted for only 3% of the clinical trial participants for FDA-approved breast cancer drugs. Policies have been put in place to increase the representation of women in clinical trials, but we need policies that also increase the representation of other sociodemographic groups so that we can ensure that all of our clinical trials that will lead to the development of novel therapeutics, de devices, and technologies will have an impact on all of the populations um, that will benefit. And so they need to be included in the initial testing. An excellent example of this comes from the Columbia-Pfizer partnership, which is focusing on increasing diversity, not just in participants, but also across clinical trial lists, so the investigators running these trials. And this, um, this initiative will also enhance access to high quality healthcare for traditionally underrepresented and underserved groups. So the past has shown us that persistent inequities in breast cancer, in, including the incidence of more aggressive disease at younger ages, poorer survival, and greater mortality among black women are attributable to a combination of social determinants of health, not just race. In the next 50 years, and thinking about how we advance our efforts to address um, cancer mortality and really move the needle to address health inequities, we need to think about addressing these inequities across the cancer continuum. So by including diverse, inclusive populations in the research that really understands the biology of cancers and etiology of cancers, that would lead us to precision prevention so that we can promote and, and identify novel ways to prevent cancer in, in our populations, not just in the US, but globally, and more importantly, in the communities that we're situated in. I'll also add that 
a greater push, and we've talked about this, or we've heard a lot about this this afternoon, but interdisciplinary research where there are investigators from multiple different areas, multiple different areas of expertise um, will also be important. And thinking about the, comp the, the intersection of social determinants of health and biology. So this is how we'll uncover the sociobiologic mechanisms of cancer and how we'll understand and address cancer inequities moving forward. I just want to put this slide up here because all of the things that we've been considering, all of the risk factors and me mechanisms, they all act at multiple intersecting levels of influence. And so thinking about all of these levels of influence, a major important, you know, a major um, thing that we have to consider is making sure that we involve our community partners and really involving the community in the research questions that we're asking and how we can help them achieve health equity. So with that, I want to end my talk with three words, racism, not race. Racism is not a risk factor for poor health. I'm sorry, racism is a risk factor for poor health. Race is not a risk factor for poor health. And only through action, only through the actions taken that will combat or target racism will we ever move towards health equity. Thank you.